Cyclone Education Week Part 2, a quick reminder of the schedule here. When storms form, they can be categorised into various classifications, the most well known of these scales being the Saffir Simpson Hurricane Wind Scale, although other scales exist too and we'll cover all of the main ones here. So, the Saffir Simpson Hurricane Scale is divided into five hurricane categories to accompany the pre-existing tropical depression status, a storm with less than 40 mph winds and not completely developed, and a tropical storm, a cyclone with winds between 40 and 73 mph. The categories are numbered from 1 to 5, with 1 being the lowest. A Category 1 hurricane contains 1 minute sustained winds of between 73 and 95 miles per hour and is likely to cause damage to unprepared or poorly constructed buildings. Recent examples of Category 1 storms are last year's Hurricane Ingrid in the Atlantic, Typhoon Tapper last month in the Western Pacific and Hurricane Barbara in the Eastern Pacific last year. Stronger storms go on to achieve Category 2 intensity with winds between 96 and 110 miles per hour and is likely to cause at least roof damage to well-constructed buildings as well as topple a significant amount of trees which in itself becomes a hazard. Recent examples of Category 2 storms are Hurricane Henriette last year in the Eastern Pacific, Typhoon Fito which struck China and Typhoon Wu Tip which struck Vietnam on the day that Fito formed. If a storm intensifies beyond this threshold, it becomes a major hurricane, categories 3 to 5. A category 3 hurricane packs winds of between 111 and 129 miles per hour and is likely to cause significant damage to residential buildings and could cause extended power outages and water shortages in the areas of most impact. Recent examples of Category 3 storms are Hurricane Sandy at its peak in the Atlantic, Hurricane Raymond in the Eastern Pacific last year, and Typhoons Navi and Crozer in the Western Pacific. The second highest category is reserved for storms with sustained winds of 130 to 156 miles per hour, Category 4. A storm of this intensity is likely to cause catastrophic damage near the point of impact and a landfall area could be rendered uninhabitable for a significant amount of time. Recent examples of Category 4 storms are Hurricane Ophelia in 2011, the latest one in the Atlantic, as well as Typhoon Utor in the Western Pacific last year, and Cyclones Ian and Ita in the Southern Pacific observed earlier this year. Category 5 is the highest intensity category on the Saffir Simpson Hurricane Scale for storms that exceed 157 miles per hour one minute sustained winds. Only a handful of storms reach this intensity and are likely to cause catastrophic damage in the wider landfall area and some places may be completely destroyed and unrecognisable. Most homes would be destroyed and power outages may continue for months after the storm. Recent Category 5 storms are Typhoon Haiyan and Cyclones Phelan and Gillian. Whilst the Saffir Simpson Hurricane Scale can be applied to any storms, it is only officially used in the Atlantic and Eastern Pacific. Other areas, under the responsibility of other weather agencies, use their own scales. The Japanese Meteorological Agency Scale for the Western Pacific, the Australian Scale around Australia, the Indian Meteorological Department Scale in the North Indian Ocean, and Matteo Francis Scale for the Southwest Indian Ocean. In part 1, we already saw how a storm forms and develops, but what happens after that? Well, we know that high amounts of vertical wind shear and dry air environment can kill off a storm, but lack of sufficient sea surface temperature, another key factor in development, doesn't necessarily mean the end of a storm. In fact, it often leads to transition into a storm's next phase. As a storm curves polewards, away from the equator as they naturally would, it becomes inevitable that if the storm hasn't already been taken out by poor conditions in its environment or by a landfall, that low sea surface temperatures will end its existence as a tropical storm. As we saw in part 1, warm waters are really the starting point for storm development, and without that the established, self-sustaining cyclone can only last so long before transitioning into a cold-core extra-tropical storm. 
around the world's mid-latitudes, that's the area between the tropics and the polar regions, extratropical storms are common throughout the year. Whilst generally not as intense as tropical storms, sometimes extratropical cyclones can cause dangerous weather. A less common type of storm is a subtropical cyclone, where a storm is neither tropical or extratropical, but shares characteristics from both groups. These storms were known as hybrid storms until they were officially named subtropical in the 1970s, and when these storms form in the Atlantic, they are included in that year's naming list along with tropical storms. Extratropical storms typically remain unnamed. More about cyclone naming in part 3. Earlier we heard about the Saffir Simpson hurricane wind scale and anticipated effects from each of its categories. However, for land areas, tropical cyclones bear other threats than just its strong winds. So, we know that winds can be dangerous and is often the most damaging factor of major hurricanes, but even weaker storms can pose a threat depending on its characteristics. Tropical storms are typically the wettest type of storm, and so if a storm makes landfall and is moving slowly, it won't take long before there is a flooding concern, particularly if the area has had a lot of rain already. Many examples exist where flooding has been the main cause of death and destruction. Perhaps the most tragic of these was Typhoon Nina in 1975, which had lost typhoon status before making landfall in China. Here it killed nearly a quarter of a million people when a series of dams succumbed to the storm. Another example was in Texas, when Tropical Storm Allison stalled over the area for days. Even though the storm was weak, its rainfall amounts totaled 40 inches in some places, and 70,000 homes were flooded. With bigger storms, along with its winds, they can also carry a large storm surge. A storm surge is a rise in the sea level in and around the storm, and this becomes particularly notable when it makes landfall. Strong winds from the storm blow towards land, pushing the water over the land area. The dynamics of the ocean bottom in the miles leading up to the land area also contribute to the intensity of the storm surge. A shallow, gradually sloping ocean floor is more conducive to a large storm surge. Other factors, such as the storm's central pressure, can affect the resulting surge. Two of the most publicised instances of storms which dealt great damage with their storm surges were hurricanes Katrina and Ike in the Gulf Coast. Katrina was a strong storm causing $108 billion in damages in Louisiana and Mississippi. A lot of this damage occurred when its storm surge led to the failure of the levee system around New Orleans. The result, four-fifths of the city were submerged and 100,000 homes and businesses were flooded. Katrina remains to be the costliest hurricane in history, ahead of Sandy in 2012. Hurricane Ike made landfall in Texas as a Category 2 storm, but brought with it a 20-foot storm surge, causing nearly $30 billion in damages along the Gulf Coast. These are the main direct causes of damage and fatalities on land areas. In the next part, we'll take a look at the overview and history of storm observations, naming and storm warnings.